Now, let's talk about middleware. So, the uh, message-oriented middleware, or MOM, and you're going to see a, a few Adipole-type uh, references in here, um, but MOM is a way for applications to communicate amongst themselves, um, and really the big benefit is that they're completely decoupled, so they don't necessarily have to know about anybody else being out there. If I have a piece of information, and I think it might be interesting, I send it to my middleware, and my middleware makes sure it gets to anybody who actually cares about getting it. Okay? So that's sort of a straightforward uh, view of it. They're really, I don't need to know who they are. There are two primary paradigms about how this gets done today. Um, you're probably familiar with these. Publish and subscribe is one of the very common ones, and then queuing is the other one. So with publish and subscribe, it's really a case of um, I have a piece of information and I broadcast it out, and if you care, you subscribe. It's more like the sort of the television model, you know, you, I'm broadcasting, and if, if you want to tune in, you'll get it, and if you don't, you won't. Um, and then the queuing one is, I'm going to take all the m messages I have, I'm going to drop them into a nice big bucket, and then you can come along and read out of that bucket whenever you want. Okay, and those are two very common uh, forms. Typically, you use some sort of a naming scheme to put on your messages, so when you send out some information, you're able to say what it is in advance. Now, in the market data world, which is where we primarily use middleware, um, this would commonly be the symbol that you're trading. So if you were trading, uh, for example, IBM, which is the common uh, ticker symbol that everybody talks about, you know, you'll name it quote.ibm or something along those lines. And now when I publish that out, anybody who's actually interested, they just tell their middleware, uh, I'd like to subscribe to any message that comes by with a subject name, quote.ibm. Okay, so that's pretty common. Queues would also have a name. You would say, I want to go to the quote queue, or you know, the equities quote queue, or the foreign exchange quote queue, or the commodities queue. And then you could just start reading from those queues. Um, now, this is a key point um, about why we're here. There are a range of middleware systems out there, and they are pretty much uh, mostly proprietary. So typically, the API that these middleware systems use is custom to the platform it was de developed for, um, and you don't get to um, you know, sort of uh, really uh, swap around easily because if you're using one middleware platform, you've developed to their API, and if you choose to move to another one, you now have to switch and write to their API, okay? So let's take a look at what this might be like. So if you see here, this is, I've obviously made this as absolutely simple as I possibly could. But if you were, for example, to have the market, in this case the New York Stock Exchange, sending a quote out, typically what a, what a firm might do with that quote is they would have a process called a feed handler. Okay, and it would listen to that packet. The, the quotes come down on a UDP multicast um, uh, basis, and every exchange ha typically has a proprietary format for how the data is published and, and how it looks. So you see a packet, you need to have a feed handler that will take that information and, you know, for example, normalize it, turn it into something that your downstream application can understand. You don't want to have to write your application to understand the difference between the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ Exchange and ARCA and the CME and the London Stock Exchange and all the others. It becomes very messy if every single application needs to know about every one of those markets. So you'll typically write a feed handler that will normalize it. It would then send that update as a message on a middleware system to a caching system. And the cache is a last known value cache. So it will take the update and it will say there might be 100 fields in a record and only 10 changed. It will take the 10 that are new, it will insert them into the cache, and then the cache will publish the update down to an algorithm. The algorithm will then say, is it a good time to buy or sell this particular instrument? Um, if it decides it is, it will create an order and it will send it to a gateway. And there's a couple of other steps that could happen in the middle here. but. Just trying to make it very simple. And the gateway will then format that trade into a type of message that the exchange is, the particular exchange you're sending to understands, and it will forward it to that. Okay, so this would be a very sort of straightforward approach. Now you could just go ahead and write the feed handler to make a socket connection to the cache, and the cache to the algo, and the algo to the gateway, and you'd be good to go. But it starts to get more complicated because nobody ever goes to just one market. 
So often people will get different types of feeds in. So here I'm showing you know, just one market. Typically they would have 10 or 20 or 30 different markets. Uh, I've also got a consolidated market data feed in here, which is where you care to see information maybe from around the world where you, know, you want a, a more, more breadth without having to uh, take in all those raw feeds. Um, so you might take a consolidated feed, in this case super feed. And you might be creating your own prices. For example, if you're trading FX, a bank will always put its own spread on that and publish out that rate to its users. So it's not just taking what was the last trade, but it's taking that and saying, but if we're going to trade this, we want X amount of margin on the trade. Okay? So now I've got three systems. So now I would have to do socket connections from all three to the cache. So adding any one of those means I'm touching that cache. And every time I touch a piece of software, I'm risking breaking it. Uh, now I'm probably doing more algorithms, so I've got three of those up there, and now I'm actually trading on multiple different markets as well, so I have three more of those. But I'm still not done, because I might want to add desktop traders who want to look at the prices coming down. The problem with the desktop traders is that uh, the, the market data rates are way too high for any typical uh, laptop or desktop uh, you know, machine to keep up with those rates. So for example, the options price reporting feed um, peaks at over 6 million updates per second coming off the feed. Okay, so this is very high volume. You basically, to handle all North American equities and options, you need at least a 10 gigabit pipe um, just on the backbone where all those feed handlers are. Uh, so it's very, very high volume that you need. So you're not going to get a desktop to subscribe to that. So you might decide to put in something called a conflation cache, which will actually listen to all the changes but it will only release an update on a set time period. So every interval, maybe every half a second, I'll give you a new tick. And at that instant, it is the correct price. But I didn't do it every, you know, I might have traded 100 times in between uh, my uh, sending you each one of those updates. But, you know, given that it takes you quite a while to click and type in your order, that's, you know, you're generally not doing low latency trading if you're involved at all. Um, so now you need another process in there. And then, of course, another very common thing people will do is they want to capture all these ticks. And then this is now mission critical trading, you know, billions of dollars a day, if not trillions. Uh, so you better be monitoring it all. Um, now, if you look at the view of what that looks like, if you did it point to point, you're making lots and lots of arrows between lots of systems. And I haven't even shown full tolerance. And I haven't shown when you actually start to add the correct number of processes that are doing this. So trying to make all socket connections between all of these things will completely kill your, um, your management capability. It'll kill your performance. Um, it'll require you to send the updates three times. Uh, typically, we use multicast in between. So you know, if you're point to point, you're going you're to kill that. Um, but you have to send it 100 times if there's 100 people looking. OK, so there really are. Um, uh, you can do this without middleware. It looks like this, and it looks a lot worse when you go into production. OK? All right, just uh, because I know not everybody here is in financial services, um, you know, I just want to put up a few other use cases for where people use middleware. Maybe some of you are familiar with these already. Um, you know, in the high performance computing space where you have you know, two, three, 10,000 nodes all doing little jobs, processing different requests, it's quite common to use a middleware platform to distribute out the data that those jobs need and maybe even the instructions to the machines to say, uh, hey, you start working on this job and you work on this job. And it can be done quite easily with a middleware because you sort of put topics on all the messages and then you have certain nodes listening for certain topics and other nodes listening for other topics. And it means that when you go to scale, you can throw on another thousand servers and you just start telling them you listen out for a different range of topics. So you're really splitting up your topic space rather than you know, your socket space where you're making connections. So that's quite a common use case. Uh, Service-oriented architecture, that's, that was, I suppose, about five years ago. That was the big buzzword. Everybody was really into SOA. Um, but the basic idea of have, writing your code as modules, and each you just add in a new module. And if you do this type of model, you really need a middleware underneath it um, so that, you, again, you're not impacting every other component as you add a new one. Scalable web database queries. So middleware is used very heavily by the likes of eBay and Google and other um, big, you know, web, uh, web environments where they want to try to send, um, you know, you send your request. Uh, they might 
broadcasted out and all the databases have queues of queries and, and one says, great, that's my topic space, I'll grab it and I'll run that response. And so it gives you a very much, much easier way to scale out your environment there. Uh, and then the last one that's, uh, you know, quite common as well as in transactional applications. So going to a cash machine, taking money out of the cash machine, uh, you know, when you get the $20 bill, or maybe more if you're lucky, um, you, they want to make sure that that message from wherever you are in the world makes it back to the correct database and updates the database and updates the backup database and then commits both and then comes back and confirms before giving you the money. Okay, so they'll typically use a middleware platform. They have a transaction process manager then to ensure that it gets done. And if it fails for some reason, it might have updated one, but it failed the, the backup, you roll it back. And again, this can be easily, more easily handled if you have a middleware in between your applications. Okay, so that's a basic idea. That's enough of uh, setting the stage. Um, so what is Open Mama then, and what, what are we doing? Well. MAMA stands for the Middleware Agnostic Messaging API, and I mentioned that there's a lot of, you know, mother-type references here. But um, it is a, an API that we developed about eight years ago to try to shield us from the fact that there were lots of different choices of middleware that all of our clients were using. So every time we went to a new client and we were trying to sell them a market data ticker plant with feed handlers and all of these capabilities, they would come back and say, well, we use Tibco Rendezvous, and oh, we have to support that, and somebody else uses LBM, and somebody else wants a, uh, you know, Elvin, and somebody else wanted some other middleware. And it, we couldn't every time take our feed handlers, recompile, every time we had a change, uh, recompile the feed handler and link it you know, to three, four, five different middlewares and then go through the whole QA cycle every time. So we chose to write a wrapper layer that we could protect ourselves with. Okay? So we support a variety of messaging platforms already. I'll talk a little bit about which ones we've got covered in a minute. We make it very consistent. So when you write to Mama, you don't have to uh, know about which middleware you're using. Um, and we made it very, very high performance. Uh, this is an absolute critical feature um, of this API. If it was going to slow people down, we would never get anybody to use it. Um, because people in our industry measure things now. They are literally measuring the performance of applications in nanoseconds now. And that's, you know, steps along the way. There might be 10 steps, but it's reasonable to think that there are people trading today in under 10 microseconds from when a quote comes in until when they make a decision and send their trade out. And that's with risk checks and everything. So people are doing absolutely ridiculous things to try to get the performance up, and they will not accept an API if it's going to slow them down. Um, so we're pretty confident that our API can, uh, can perform uh, in, under a, in under a microsecond. Uh, I think sort of the benchmarking we do is about a million updates per second of 200 byte messages, and we process that in under a microsecond. Um, uh, you know, you're getting a wrapper. That, that wouldn't be there, that microsecond, if you use the native API. Um, but the fact that you can now pick and choose when a faster middleware comes out, just plonk it right in, um, might give you the reason why you want to use it. Now, it's open MAMA now because we open sourced it and it is now contributed to the community. And any of you can go to openmama.org and download it and use it in your own applications. Um, and that's really why we're here is to try to encourage you to do that and hopefully to get you to contribute back in and continue to make this even better. We're hosting with the Linux Foundation. Um, which is a very important feature I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and we have a very, uh, um, uh, you know, complementary group of industry stakeholders that are actually behind this and helping to drive the standard and bringing it forward. So we're, we really have a great amount of momentum on this, and we want to continue that momentum and make it work. Okay, so what does this really mean? Well, if you sort of, uh, I'll flatten out the, uh, the previous diagram, which was logical anyhow. It, it, typically, you would have one middleware bus. So for example, in an environment where you might have a range of feed handlers and some caching and some algos and things running, um, and maybe you're using one of the platforms that's quite common, it's called LBM, uh, Latency Busting Messaging, was the, uh, the long name of that. But that's by a company called Informatica. Um, and if you use their middleware and write to their API, you've got your system working. But then you decide you'd like to change, for example, maybe to Tibco Rendezvous. I'm not trying to pick favorites, but just it's a very common one that's used out there. Uh, so you decide you want to change. You now need to go into all of those applications, and you need to literally rewrite them uh, to the RV API, and then uh, recode um, 
uh, recompile and then retest and everything else. That's a lot of work, that's a lot of risk. Most people don't like doing it, so they tend not to unless they really have to. If you used OpenMama instead, you write all your apps once to OpenMama, and now you can swap out the middleware without changing anything above. So in this case, I got a little plug-in for our own middleware. It's called Data Fabric 6, um, and it has an RDMA and a, multi, a, a verb level implementation. So that, now I was able to swap without having to change any of my upstream applications. Okay? So that's a considerable thing. But it's even better because I could actually use multiple types of middleware underneath the application without having to rewrite any of my applications. Okay? So these are the four that are supported today. We have our own data fabric. Um, Informatica LBM is covered, Tibco Rendezvous is covered, and there's an open source implementation um, of, of the Elvin uh, middleware, which is called Avis. Okay, those uh, four are officially supported today, and I now can, could maybe be sending quotes out of one of those and trades out of a different one. And I haven't had to change my application, I just changed the configuration of saying which topics go on which session. Okay, so that's really what's unique about that. Uh, what's better is that we've also opened it up to the industry and have got a number of vendors actually writing bridges to their middlewares um, and we're expecting uh, you know, to get a lot more. So a client could just, for example, write to IBM WebSphere MQ or MQ series as it used to be called, um, and do that today. Uh, you know, we're hopeful that we'll get uh, you know, maybe IBM to get on board and support that going forward. Um, you know, Solace System, same thing. That's a hardware accelerated middleware uh, sort of appliance. AMQP, something that Red Hat are working on, and you know, we're hoping to get them to, to support this as well. So it's now wide open that the vendors can do it or clients could do it for themselves. If they really love a middleware, just write a bridge. You still don't have to change your applications, and you get advantage of the other uh, solutions. Okay? Um, and everything is now pluggable and interchangeable just with a configuration change.